Today, I get to start a brand new series. It's a Christmas series. And we're calling it the Christmas Playlist. The Christmas Playlist. Who has some different playlists on your, uh, your phone or whatever you listen to music to? There's a lot of different playlists you can have. Maybe you have a workout playlist. And if you have a workout playlist, you probably have the Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> right? I, look, that transcends age. It doesn't matter how old you are. Everybody know bump, 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 but uh, is that right, Adam? I think so. That's right. I, I was actually thinking about wearing a superhero costume and having that music play and coming out, but I figured that would be just a little too over the top. And uh, so there, there, there are different playlists. So we have a workout playlist. We have road trip playlists. You know, get your motor running, right? <laughs> get out on the highway. Yeah, that's pretty good. I don't, the anointing, when it hits me, just things come out. It's just different. I nailed it. And then hopefully, above all else, you have a worship playlist. Some type of worship playlist. Um, you know, there's different songs. There's all kinds of different songs that you can listen to. Some are good, some are not so good. But if you have a worshipful heart, it doesn't matter if they're good or not good. It doesn't matter what era they come from. But a worship playlist. Well, in the New Testament, there are four songs that, uh, that are associated with the birth of Jesus Christ. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about each of these songs. And, and so today, we're going to dive into Mary's song. And so I want to paint a little background for you. The angel of the Lord came to Mary, told her that she's going to have a baby, and he's going to be the Messiah. And a couple days later, she goes to Elizabeth's house, who is six months pregnant with John the Baptist. And now when they come into contact with each other, when they get close to each other, the baby inside of the womb, the baby, the human baby inside of the womb of Elizabeth, leaps. Why? Because that baby inside of Elizabeth's womb is a human, alive, in well, not just some fetal tissue, and it recognizes the presence of God. And so I, I just want to take a little pause, commercial break. If a baby inside of a womb can sense the presence of God, which it can, that means it's alive. That, mean, that doesn't mean it's just responding to some stimulation. That means that, that there's, there's a living being on the inside of that mother. Break over, back to the message. And so what ends up happening is Elizabeth and Mary, they start celebrating the things of God, talking about the things of God, and, and rejoicing. And then all of a sudden, like on, on the sound of music or some other musical, Mary breaks out into a song. I want you to picture that. And, and, and she starts singing this song that we're about to read. And it goes like this. I don't want a lot for Christmas. There's just one thing I need. I don't care about the presents underneath the... Oh, Whoops, I think I took it from the wrong playlist. The, sorry, uh, my Mariah Carey playlist got stuck in my notes somehow. I apologize. Who never wants to hear the Mariah Carey song ever again? Uh, I'm there with you. I apologize. Some of you are really holy and you're like, what in the world is that? I envy you. <laughs> I wish I never heard that song either. All right, no. In, in Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 46, the Bible says this. Mary responded. Somebody say responded. responded. That's, that's, a, uh, that's not the point of this message, but there's an underlying theme. Responsiveness is important when it comes to the presence of God. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. Somebody say praise. Praise. How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. I want you to notice something here. Mary says, in God my Savior. Mary was born with a sin nature. She wasn't born sinless. Mary was as in need of a Savior as anybody else. And so I just want to help us understand that, that Mary, uh, she needed a Savior. She, Jesus is Mary's Savior as well. However, I want us to also understand that Mary should be honored. She is the Savior's mother after all. And so it's important that we honor Mary. Verse 48 says, For he took notice, listen to me, he took notice of the, his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations, somebody say all generations, will call me blessed. Mary was blessed to be the Savior's mother. Verse 49, For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. 
He shows, me mercy, he shows mercy from generation to generation to all who what? Fear him. His mighty arms, his mighty arm has done great things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. The Bible says, she said, she, she recognizes in this moment and she's praising God, singing this song, and she recognizes that the arm of God has done great things. Has, God's, has God ever done some tremendous things for you? Amen. Has God ever done something great for you? Is there anything that you have to, uh, be, look, yes, besides the birth, has God ever done anything for you since you got saved? If, if that's true, give God a hand clap of praise. Let's give a little bit of a, a shout to Jesus this morning. I love it. Listen, his, his hand is not shortened that it does not save and his ear is not heavy that it does not hear. That's what the Bible says. And so we need to have communion with God and know that he's going to come through for us. Listen, the tremendous things that God has done is not all the tremendous things that God will ever do. He has more tremendous things to do in our future. Can I get an amen? Amen. He has filled, and I, I want you to hear this. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. God can change things. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. Listen, I, I, I was reading that. And I'm like, it's funny that the Bible doesn't say he filled the hungry with food. It says he's filled the hungry with good things, which means he's not just talking about physical hunger. He's talking, uh, she's talking in this song uh, about, about a, a hunger that goes beyond just the physical, but a spiritual hunger. Listen, we need to come hungry for the things of God. Listen, you have as much of God as you're hungry for. And so you and I, we need to come hungry for more of God. And he will, he will fill you with more of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. Verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his children forever. Somebody say, wow. wow. I'll, t I'll take that song over Mariah Carey's song any day of the week. Amen. It's a powerful song. It's a powerful prayer. But it's a powerful word for us to know. Because in it, listen to me, don't, in, this, in this song, we see what our response should be to the reality of Jesus. We, we realize from this song what our response to Jesus, to the presence of God, should be. And, and so I, I got thinking about res, a response. Uh, anybody ever been at the doctor's office and they do that little knee test and you're like, right? A little triangular instrument and they, what is that called? That little instrument, nobody knows the name of that instrument, actually. It's, it's, but they use it, and they hit it, and, you know, if they hit your knee, and your leg goes like that, that's a good response. But if they hit your knee, and your arm goes like that, that's not the right response. And so here's something interesting about that test. The, the, it's called the knee jerk test, and it actually isn't testing your knee. It's actually testing your neurological response. It's testing your brain. Isn't it interesting how by checking on your knee, they can actually check on your brain? And, and I just want to propose to you today that our, our response to the things of God, our response to the presence of God is a great indication to our health, our spiritual health. And so, look, I'm not, I, I sit up front and I look forward and, I, and I, even when I little, do a little pace thing, it's not about you. I'm not looking at anybody. I'm just kind of doing my own little pace thing, which I don't do much of because I don't want to put my mask on every two seconds. But what ends up happening is if we're in the presence of God and there's no response at all, that's an indication of where you're at in your soul, where you're at in your spirit. That's the, look, uh, here's the thing about, about a doctor. If you get your knee hit and your arm goes like that, that's not the doctor's fault that that happened. That's a good word right there. And so as a pastor, I'm just coming to you, sharing with you some different responses. And, and if in the presence of God, God, God's testing your reflex here and your arm's going here. Th listen, that's not my fault. That's, I'm just sharing with you. Something might be out of alignment and God wants to bring you into alignment today. Can I get an amen? Yeah. And so Mary shows us what the responses should be. And the first response that we see, and look, I, I just want to let you know, there are other it goes beyond the three that I'm going to share with you. Uh, but these are the three prominent things that we should experience in, the, in, in response to the reality of who Jesus is. And so the first one is joy. Somebody shout joy. 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 Mary, listen, Mary is excited. 
about the fact that Jesus is coming. And, 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 and this joy isn't just because it's her baby boy, just because it's a child. She's excited because this is her savior. She, she's excited way beyond what the, the normal response is when you're going to have a baby because she knows that with this child comes a great promise that's not only going to just affect her, but it's going to affect all mankind. Speaking of joy, I want us to go to 1 Peter chapter 1. I think it gives us a really good insight into joy. And so this, this passage, this is talking to the church, and this is many years after Jesus rose from the grave. So many, if not all, the people uh, that are being referenced here have not seen the, the living Jesus or the risen Jesus. He's sit, seated at the right hand of the Father at this point. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. Does anybody trust God today? Amen. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible, someone say inexpressible, a glorious, inexpressible joy. See, inexpressible means, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a Greek word that means that it can't, it can't be explained with mere words. In other words, it takes far more than just simple, simply words to express the joy that you have. And so I just want to encourage you. That's why it's okay to clap your hands in the presence of God. It's okay to shout with joy in the presence of God. It's okay to lift up holy hands unto the Lord. It's okay to shout hallelujah every once in a while. It's an okay thing to do that. Inexpressible. Some say inexpressible. inexpressible. But what's fascinating about this was this, this is a description of the, 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 the response to God of a people that are persecuted, facing death, facing sickness, facing disease. Listen, experience discomforts and things that you and I can't even relate to because we live in a lot of comfort and all the technology and all the things that we have, resources that we have. It really is almost impossible for us to really relate and understand how difficult it was. Yet the Bible says that their response was an inexpressible joy. Why is that? Because no matter what you or I ever go through doesn't change the reality of who Jesus is and what he's done. Can I get an amen? amen. No, listen, I, I don't know where every single person's at or what you might be going through, but whatever you're going through doesn't change the fact of who Jesus is. Jesus is the risen Savior. Jesus has done good things. And, he's, and because of who he is and what he's done and what he's going to do, he's going to come back someday. We can shout with joy. We can experience an inexpressible joy. Can I get an amen? See, too, too often our joy is connected with our circumstances. When in reality, our joy needs to be connected with our Savior. And our Savior is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I, I just want to encourage someone today, if you feel a little bit joyless, and that's not your response right now, I, I want to tell you, go back to, the, go back to the fundamental things. Go back to Jesus. Get back before the throne room of God. Come to Christ. Next time you're in prayer, and maybe even at the end of this service will be an opportunity for you, and just make it about Jesus. See, we make it about so many different things sometimes, and we complicate this thing so much. Listen, and, and listen, we're Pentecostal here. Jesus is always going to point us to the Holy Spirit, but here's what I've learned is the Holy Spirit's always going to point us back to Jesus. It, it, it just happens that way. Uh, I, I've, I've learned about it, but now I've experienced it. The more I want of the Holy Spirit, the more I get. And then the more of the Holy Spirit that I keep wanting to get, the Holy Spirit always points me back to Jesus. And then and, and all of a sudden, but as you get closer and closer and walk with Christ, what ends up happening is he's like, hey, there's more for you. Here, so here's the Holy Spirit. And, and he points us to the Holy Spirit. It's important. Listen, the more we go after Jesus, the more we'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the more we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the more joy we'll walk in. Can I get an amen? amen. Somebody shout joy. joy. The next one is hope. Somebody shout hope. 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 Our, our response to the reality of Jesus should bring us hope. We should experience hope when, when we're walking with Jesus now, this whole, this whole song that Mary writes, you see hope from the first verse to the last verse. It's just intertwined in the whole thing. There's, there's a tone of like hopefulness. But there's one verse that really stood out to me in prayer. It's verse 48. It says, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. 
I want you to see that passage right there. He took notice of his lowly servant girl. Mary was nothing special. Mary didn't do something special to catch the sight of God. See, what we need to understand today is that, that, that God has not overlooked, he did not overlook Mary, and he's not overlooked you. God sees you. Somebody say that. Somebody say, God sees me. God sees me. There's so many people, I think, that are hopeless because they wonder, where is God? And I want to challenge you and help you know today that God sees you. Your, your neighbor that, that thinks that God has overlooked them, that they're asking right now, well, where is God in all of this? I want you to know that for your neighbor, for your friend, or maybe for yourself today, that God sees you, he knows you, and he cares about you. Listen, that's a message your neighbor needs to get to know. That's a message your neighbor, that somehow, some way, through our life, we need to demonstrate that reality to our neighbors, our coworkers, our fellow, our students, our coworkers, you know, uh, uh, everybody around us. We need to make sure that they know that God sees them. And listen, th here, here's what the, the Holy Spirit is showing me right now, is that if we act like we don't see them, they're never going to believe that God sees them. That's a good word. If we go through life and the people that are around us that God wants us to reach and we just walk around with our heads stuck up in the air and not noticing the ones that God wants us to see, then they're never going to know that there's a God that sees them. It's time that we begin to see others and, and, and notice them. Because why? Because how else can we ever get the hope that we have in Christ Jesus to those that need the hope of Jesus? Listen, God knows every hair that's on your head. He, or the lack thereof. <laughs> In which part of your head has more hair than other parts? <laughs> Listen, he knows your name. He's not overlooked you. He sees you, and he knows exactly what it is that you need today in Jesus' name. I'm going to go a little deeper with this, though. Uh, a lot of conversations, I realize that people are uncomfortable going to God with their needs. A lot of people are, they, they, they almost feel selfish. They almost feel like that, that it's not okay. And, and, and I, I, wanna, I want to go after that for a moment. Because there's, there's a couple different types of people that I see in the Bible. The first, the Pharisees. And you notice that when you, when you look in the Bible, they never ask Jesus for anything. They never ask God for anything. They're just all stuck on what they can bring to God. Have you noticed that? They're, 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 they're obsessed with how selfless they serve God and what they can bring to God. And, 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 and that's the Pharisees. So on one side, you have these people that are so holy and so righteous and so great, and they, they don't need anything from God. They never ask. You don't ever see a prayer in the Bible from a Pharisee saying, God, God help. In fact, all you see is criticism constantly of the things of God. And then you have another group of people, we would probably say a pretty needy group of people, just coming to God and asking him for all kinds of things, traveling great distances and, and coming before God and saying, God, I, I, look, I don't have anything and the little bit that I do have you, here it is, but I don't have anything to give you. Really, I need you to give to me. I need you to help me. And, and, and what was Jesus' response to the di two different gr groups of people? See, C.S. Lewis calls it need love. That we step out of our bounds when we try to love God with a, with, with, with a, uh, 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 the term is there, but COVID's still on the brain. It's like unconditional love. Somebody say unconditional. unconditional. So when we try to love God in an unconditional way, we're stepping into his authority. But when we come to God with a need love, we're actually walking as children with childlike faith. There was one part of one of the songs that were sung, that, that faith like a child. And I'm actually going to disagree with the line, God gives us the faith like a child. Well, what? God doesn't give us faith like a child. God, Jesus commands us, come to me with faith like a child. There's a difference there. That means we have the ability to decide whether I'm going to come to God with faith like a child or not. And what, what, what does a child do when they come to a parent? They have needs, and they express those needs. And so I just want to encourage, maybe you're sitting there today, and you feel selfish bringing your needs up to God all the time. I'll tell you, how often should you bring your needs up to God until God starts to meet those needs? Every time you go into prayer, go to prayer and, and seek after God. 
See, the difference that we're talking about is, is looking at God through a relationship of, of religiosity or a relationship, uh, or, or a relationship through, through sonship or daughtership. See, we can go to God with anything. Now, that doesn't mean we don't serve God. Right? That, that doesn't mean we don't come to God and start serving Him and, and continually serve Him. It just means that we, that we serve God out of a heart of, of reliance on God Himself. Right? So what did the people on the one side do? Every time God came to them and, and met their need, they started telling everybody about the great things of God. Right? They, they started shouting, God healed me. God did this. God set the captive free. The, the person that was filled with demons, God came and delivered them. And now they're walking and talking in, in their sound mind, bragging about the things of God. See, I think it's time that we start bragging about the things of God, bragging about what it is that God has done. Can I get an Amen. Because it's about reliance. Somebody say reliance. reliance. We have to come to a place where we rely on God. But then there's another side of it that has infiltrated different churches. And, and, and I wrote that it's a consumerism within the church. We almost get entitled because God, listen, God does act. God does do. He does miracles. And, and so what we have to be careful of is that, that we don't become consumers and we just sit back in our chair on Sunday and wait for God to show up and do something for us and then we go and do our business uh, elsewhere. No, what we have to do is we have to be, understand that God has called us to serve and do something great for him. Can I get an amen? amen. But that comes from a heart of servant, servanthood. Somebody say hope. See, what, what, what we have, when we stop relying on the Lord, we become self-reliant. And when we become self-reliant, what ends up happening is now we have lost the reason for our hope. You stop hoping. You, and you begin to go down this path of hopelessness. And so our language, or at least in our head, starts sounding a little bit like this. Well, I've prayed a long time for this, and this isn't going to happen, and I, I just don't think it's going to happen anymore. Like, I know people are going to get saved on Sunday, but what's going to end up happening is they're going to be excited for a few weeks, and then they're just not going to show up anymore. I, I, I know God can heal, but why would God heal my situation? I, I, I know God helped their relationship and their marriage over there, but really, truly, doubt, deep down inside, what ends up happening is you start th wondering, well, can God really s restore my marriage? And so we have to make sure that we continually rely on God and have hope. Let's not ever lose our reliance. See, when, here's a sign and a symptom. So uh, uh, here's a sign and a symptom of someone that's lost their reliance on God. They've lost their devotional life. It's really quiet in here right now. So that either means I'm preaching really good or I'm just like speaking Greek to you guys and you're not getting it. What is the test to know if I've lost my reliance on God? When, I, when, when my Bible gets dusty. <laughs> when, when, God, when God who knows everything starts to, starts to wonder what my voice sounds like. Uh, how, how do I know when, when my reliance on God isn't there? It's when, listen to me, it's when the voice of God starts becoming foreign to me. That's good preaching. And so what happens is when we get into this place, we start to lose hope. And when we start to lose hope, we begin to get, become hopeless. And the challenge for Christians is that it's, hard to, it's harder to identify hopelessness in Christians because you, you know all the right language and you know what you're supposed to do. And so what we need to do is come back to a reliance on Jesus. Does any, is anybody willing to put all your cares upon the Lord today? Is anybody willing to just trust in the Lord? See, reliance means we trust. Some say trust. You, there, you are, we are not relying on the Lord if we're not trusting in the Lord. If we're not trusting in the Lord, we're not relying on the Lord. And, and so we have to come back to a place of trust with the Lord. And, and, and that is knowing that, that what God said will come to pass. That God is, uh, God, he will stick to his word. That whatever he said, whatever he promised. And we see that because what did Mary say at the end of her song? She said, listen, the promises you gave to Abraham and all his ancestors, uh, you are coming through with that promise. And so we see and we know that she had hope. And that leads us to the third thing, faith. Somebody say faith. 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 
Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you lose your hope, guess what? You have nothing to attach your faith to. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So here we go to Mary's song. And worship team, if you'd come on up, that'd be great. Back to Mary's song. Before she ever saw her Savior's face, before, before she ever held her baby, I, I want you to get this. Before she, she ever held Jesus, before she ever saw his face, before she ever knew what he even looked like, she began to sing this song of faith. See, faith speaks to that which is not as though it is. Faith, here's a promise from God. Are you, are you with me? Have I lost everybody or something? Let, let, let's refocus right up here. Yes, the worship team is climbing up on, this, on the platform. But Mary, she began, she began to sing the song before she had the promise. And see, that's what faith does. See, what we think is that we pray and then we wait and when God responds and answers our prayer, then that's when we worship and we have faith. No, that's not how it works. How it works is when we pray and we seek after God, we go to a place where we, we can begin to thank God before we ever receive the promise. Right now, if, if you're struggling with some hidden sin, hidden sin today, my suggestion to you would be to do this. Don't, don't beat yourself down and, and get all discouraged and all bent out of shape and, and feeling like a loser. What I would do is I'd go to God, I'd pray, God, help me with this thing that I'm dealing with. And then go and start declaring the truth over yourself. You say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you for delivering me, Lord. Thank you that I'm going to walk the way that you want me to walk. Maybe your marriage is struggling and, and you pray. Don't wait for your husband to change, to have faith. Start having faith now. Start speaking to that which is not as though it is. Can I get an amen? What, what loved ones, what people, see, see, this is the challenge. See, back to that previous point, this is the difference to, uh, between those who are relying on God and not. Those who rely on God always have something to pray about or someone to pray about, somebody to pray for. Why? Because in our reliance with the Lord, He gives us hope. And when other people see the hope that we have, it produces relationships and people start wanting what we want, but they don't necessarily start coming to church right away. And so people that rely on God have people to pray for, ha have issues other than their own to pray for. And so what we can start doing is attach our faith to their situations. And so maybe you know somebody that's dealing with cancer. Maybe you know somebody that doesn't know God yet. Maybe you have a family member that they're just looking for some hope. Those are great things to start praying about and attaching our faith to. Thank God. For, may, may, think of that one friend that doesn't know Jesus yet right now. Think of that one friend that doesn't know Jesus. And just start thanking God. Thank you, Lord, for saving that person. Thank you, Lord, that, that, that you're going to help that person come to know you. Thank you, Lord, that, that, that if you save me, then you can certainly save them. You didn't just die for me. You also died for them. See, that faith speaks to that, that which is not as though it is. And it's time that we begin to walk in faith in Jesus' name. So it's time that we start declaring things in Jesus' name. I'll tell you what, when, when, I, when I was in the hospital, when I was having this sickness, you know, it was discouraging. But at the same time, you, you know what I did? I just kept thanking God. Thank you, Lord, for healing me. Thank you, Lord, for healing me. Thank you, God. Th th thank you, Lord, for touching my body. Thank you, Lord. And, and I did that with my kids and my wife, too. I said, thank you, Lord. When, when we first found out that they had COVID, I was like, thank you, Lord, that it's going to be mild. Thank you, Lord, that it's, gonna, it's not going to be even enough. And you know what? It only affected her for like two or three days. And my kids, they thought they were on vacation. They played out in the backyard the entire day. Why? I, I don't believe it's for any other reason except we declared that thing. And so the challenge is, well, why did you end up going to the hospital? Why did, you know what? Th see, that's not faith. Wondering, though, see, the enemy loves to get us into the wondering. Well, why did this or why did that? And so instead of doing that, getting in that trap, you know what I choose to do? Just to walk in faith and declare things. And, and you know, gratitude is another response that I didn't list here. 
Lord. So how about we just with, with faith just start, start speaking to things. Thank you, Lord, for healing me. Thank you for protecting me. Thank you for, see, if enough of God's people start walking like that, I believe we'll start seeing a lot more results. In fact, I know we'll start seeing a, a lot more results. And so imagine if we all get together and, and, and come in unity together. And, and, and instead of just one of us praying for one of those lost people, but imagine if all of a sudden we all started praying for the friend, of Jamie's friend, who needs to come to the Lord. And, and we're in a great, thank you. Every morning you wake up and say, you know, that friend that Jamie has, thank you, Lord, that you're going to, today could be the day that you come into his, that person's life in Jesus' name. Imagine if we function like that as a body of, of Christ. I'll tell you, it will produce things. Why? Because our words have power. And there is no faith without words. Faith speaks. Somebody say speaks. Faith is not silent. See, every, the enemy wants to make you silent. But faith speaks. And the, if the enemy can't get you to be silent because you talk a lot, then what he's going to try to do is he's going to try to get you to speak doubt and, and discouragement and, and, and criticism and all the things that the enemy would love for you to speak. But let's not do that. How about we just walk in faith and speak truth? Speak righteousness. Maybe you have a loved one that's just living a, a wrong lifestyle and, and just going the wrong direction. Man, you know what I would suggest? Just start speaking righteousness. Lord God, I thank you that you died for their sins and that you sanctify us. We don't sanctify ourselves. And that someday, I, even though I don't see it right now, someday they're going to walk in paths of righteousness as well. In Jesus' name. Sometimes, man, we just have to change the way we talk sometimes. And I'll tell you, Mary, I, I don't know how she talked before that too much, but I know one thing. She was, I can tell from that song and from other uh, little pieces of the Bible that she was an encourager, that she was an uplifter, that she was somebody that, uh, I don't think Mary ever told Jesus, you, you, you would never succeed at that. <laughs> now it helps that Jesus is God, so that, that's kind of a help. But I'll tell you, the Lord's been speaking this to me. Because externally, it's really easy to do this. But internally, there's a battle that goes on, doesn't it? Siri decided to talk to me. You can say all the right things out here. However, what goes on, this is where the real battle takes place. And that's where the victory, but that's also where the battle takes place is where the victory is won.